What's up, everybody? This is Alex Christopher with The Duran, and I'm here with Alexander Merkurs, editor-in-chief of The Duran. And today we're going to be talking about Russia's ability to weather the economic storm. Well, Alexander, as I said in my, uh, in my intro, there is an economic storm. A lot of it is uh, due to Turkey. A lot of it's due to the sanction uh, war that uh, some may say Trump started. Some may say that uh, Trump moved forward. Others can say that this economic uh, war, this financial war, was already brewing from the Obama years with uh, whatever trade surpluses were in existence. Um, either way, we do have um, a lot of economic instability. And Russia has been, to an extent, caught up in it. But uh, regardless of how the mainstream media is trying to lump Russia and Turkey together in the same basket, there are key fundamental differences between the two economies. And there are key differences as to why Russia will come out of it. Uns I don't want to say unscathed. You'll get into that in detail in a minute. But Russia will come out of it relatively fine, and Turkey may not. So can you quickly uh, tell, talk to our viewers and explain what those key differences are between Russia's uh, economy and Turkey's economy, and why Russia is in a much stronger position to weather the sanctions and the economic instability uh, in the world today? I, I'm glad you brought this up, actually, Alex, because, of course, people are lumping these two economies together. They call them emerging market economies, which implies that there is some similarity between them. They are completely different. Uh, Russia, let, if we look at Russia, Russia runs a big trade surplus. R Turkey runs a massive trade deficit. That's one of the fundamental differences between the two. Russia runs a big budget surplus, currently 2.5% of nominal G GDP. Turkey always runs a big budget deficit. Russia has falling inflation. It's around zero over, it's been around zero over the last few weeks. It's around 2.5% uh, over the year as a whole. Turkey's inflation is around 16% and it's rising fast. Russia has an independent central bank. In Turkey, the central bank is completely under President Erdogan's thumb. Russia has positive real interest rates, in other words, interest rates well above inflation, which encourages people to save. Turkey, well, they don't really have interest rates there because President Erdogan thinks interest rates are a bad thing. So uh, interest rates are below inflation and he won't raise them. And last but not least, President uh, Putin is a, as we've discussed many times, is a very serious leader. He listens to his economic advisors. He's built up very big financial reserves. Um, President Erdogan does everything himself. He appoints members of his family to take charge. He doesn't listen to anybody who doesn't agree with him. And he runs the ship all by himself. So we are looking at two completely different economies run in a completely different way. And that's not even looking at the productive resources of Russia and comparing them with Turkey. R Turkey is not able to produce advanced Suhoi fighter jets like Russia can. I mean, Russia is scientifically, industrially, economically a far more advanced economy than Turkey is. And to call the one an emerging market economy and to lump it with the other is completely wrong. Can you go into a little more depth as to Russia's uh, productive capabilities? Because there's also a, there's also this this narrative in the West, and they say it a lot. Russia makes nothing, and Russia is just uh, a, a country masquerading as a as a petrol station, as a gas station. Um, you hear that a lot in in the United States. You even hear Senator John McCain and Lindsey Graham say these things. But can you go into a little more depth as to the, the power of, of Russia's productive capability and how much of it it's harnessing? I remember one time in the past, real quick, when we were talking, when you were in Moscow, you, you, were, you mentioned how Russia's this big economic wheel. And it may be moving slowly, but once it gets turning, you're looking at, at, at a very uh, powerful economic force. Can you go into a little more depth of that? 
Uh, again, this is absolutely crucial. And unless you understand this, you do not understand Russia and you do not understand what is happening in the modern world. First of all, Russia is a hugely productive economy. It has a massive oil and gas energy complex. It's also got a flourishing agricultural system. Russia is now the biggest exporter of wheat in the world. It's overtaken the US and Canada, and it's only really getting started with its agricultural exports. Um, in fact, it's, it's, everybody expects Russia Russian agriculture to boom. But looking beyond that, it has a massively advanced and very big manufacturing and scientific and industrial base. Now, this isn't, I think, really always understood, but Russia is the only country in the world, apart from the United States and China, which produces the full range of manufactured goods. It makes everything. It makes motor cars, it makes machine tools, it makes ga ma gas turbines, it makes aircraft, it makes rockets, it makes missiles, it makes supercomputers. You name it, Russia makes it. The only difference between China, uh, certainly China, and the reason people don't realize this is that because of the present situation in Russia's economic history, Russia doesn't export very much of what it makes. At this moment in time, demand within Russia for Russia's own goods is, is so great that it fully satisfies and absorbs supply. Nonetheless, because Russia is able to supply all the goods it makes, it runs a very small deficit, even on manufactured goods. I mean, it could, it, I, I, I read somewhere that it actually imports fewer manufactured goods than countries like Finland. So, I mean, that gives you some idea of what a hugely productive economy it actually is. Now, there are a lot of things in Russia that need to be sorted out because it went through many years of deep turbulence in the 1990s and thereafter. But with every year that passes, this industrial and scientific complex gets stronger. And if you study the Russian economy as closely as I do, um, you can see it. And in some fields, like nuclear energy, it is already the world leader. How, how much of this... Uh, this a positive um, economic output and this potential is owed to Putin and owed to Putin's well, uh, presidency over the last uh, 16, 18 years, I believe. I think, I think a huge amount is. Now, first of all, one has to say that Russia came out of the crisis of the 1990s with what was potentially a hugely powerful economy because, I mean, it had built up in the long years of the Soviet Union and before that a, a very powerful scientific industrial system. But, of course, in the 1990s, it was wrecked. I mean, if you went to Russia in the 1990s, as I did, everything had completely stopped. What turned things round in Russia was not the rise in oil prices that people talk about. It was the return of rational economic decision making by Mr. Putin and his officials. Now, they've had a mountain of things to sort out because the mess in the 1990s was so bad. But in a very methodical and systematic way, they are sorting it out. And they are doing so in a way that has preserved macroeconomic stability, thus the big reserves, thus the budget surplus, thus the trade surplus, thus all the other things that I spoke about at the beginning of this program. Yeah, going back to the ruble, um, the ruble took uh, quite a fall uh, yesterday. And um, it has reached levels, I believe it's reached uh, levels of 2015, 2016. Um, so it's, it, it's lost a lot of value. How is this good for Russia and how is this bad for, mm -hmm. for Russia? Right. And, and also touch upon some of the, the way it affects uh, Russian citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Right. Let's first of all say, I mean, the, the ruble has certainly, certainly lost some value last week, but, but nothing 
on the scale of what the Turkish lira has experienced, mm -hmm. or, or what the Argentine peso has experienced, or what the Indian rupee has experienced. I mean, again, we are looking at a very volatile economic situation in the world currency markets. And of course, the ruble has been uh, affected by that because, of course, lots of currencies around the world are affected by it. But it has, it has been steadier than most. This despite the fact that on top of the turbulence that we've been discussing, Russia has to deal with the sanctions problem that it has with the United States. Now, what effect will it have on Russia? Well, uh, there are some people who think that it will increase inflation because, of course, if, it, if uh, the ruble falls, uh, the theory is um, imports become more expensive and that puts growing pressure on internal inflation. I don't think that is actually much of a problem because Russia, as I said previously, doesn't actually import that much. If you go to Russia and you see in, you see foreign cars there, say Fords or, or, or Volkswagens, more often than not now, they're actually made in Russia by factories that Ford and Volkswagen and say Mercedes is now opening a factory too, they're opening them in Russia. So as I said, it doesn't, I don't think it's going to have much of a big effect on inflation and the trend in inflation in Russia anyway is for inflation to fall. What it will do is two things. Firstly, it will make it more expensive for Russians to travel abroad. And given that this is something that Russians like to do because they weren't able to do it during the Soviet times and it's still a novel thing for them, that is going to be a hardship for some people. They're going to find that during the holiday season that it's become more expensive for them to travel abroad. However, it will keep money in Russia because they're not spending it abroad. The second thing is, of course, it will make the economy more competitive because Russian goods are priced in rubles. If the price of rubles falls, then those pr the prices of those goods in dollars and euros becomes cheaper. So it makes the Russian economy more competitive. Thirdly, it increases the budget surplus and the trade surplus even more because the goods that Russia is selling, uh, energy, oil, and gas and grain are priced in dollars predominantly and to you in euros to some extent so for every uh, a, a dollar and euro of grain oil and gas that Russia sells it's now getting more rubles and since the Russian budget is in rubles it will actually get stronger so Russia will have even more savings to spend on its own domestic economy uh, and last but not least it will, it will uh, um, enable the Russian government to uh, uh, use this money more, to spend the money that it's saving, to spend more on its very ambitious infrastructure program, which the Russian government uh, um, is investing huge amounts of money in. We saw some of the signs of that during the World Cup with the new stadiums, the new railway lines, the new airports that are being built all over the country. Now, going back to the sanctions, it's right now it's August and uh, Congress is not in session, but they will be coming back to session. And they've proposed some uh, aggressive sanctions against Russia. Um, and we talked about this in a previous video with uh, Peter Lavelle, uh, me, you and Peter Lavelle about the sanctions and some of the measures that uh, the co that Congress is proposing, and which are very aggressive. Um, take us from September until November. And the, the, the sanctions that, that, that are going to come into effect and Russia's countermeasures. And some of those countermeasures, we're starting to see them now. Um, one is they're buying a lot of gold. And number two is they're... So, I mean, I don't have much of a confirmation on this or much of a handle on this, but they're selling a lot of U.S. Treasuries or they're planning to sell, dump a lot of U.S. Treasuries. How does this um, work towards staving off some of the effects that the sanctions may have on right. Russia? 
Right. right. Now, first of all, I mean, let's take a very pessimistic view of the sanctions and let's assume that every single one of the sanctions that's been discussed comes into play. Let me come back to the thing that I was saying before. This is a continental-sized, self-sufficient economy. It produces, it, it produces all the energy it needs, it produces all the uh, um, uh, food it needs, and it produces the full range of manufactured goods. So, that kind of economy is not very vulnerable to sanctions, almost by definition, especially if it has products like oil and gas and grain that people around the world need. The United States needs cheap oil. I mean, in more than any other economy, the US depends on cheap oil. So do Europe. So, as I said, Russia's exports, its primary exports, are not going to be affected. Now, having said that, I mean, what will these sanctions do? They will further diminish foreign investment flows into Russia. But if they put downward pressure on the ruble, which they may do, that will be compensated because the Russian trade and budget surpluses will get even greater. I think one of the basic problems that the United States has is that it simply doesn't understand the size and sophistication of the economy it is dealing with. I, I know there are people who talk about Russia having a nominal GDP the size of Italy or Spain. All I can say is, if you go to Russia and spend any time traveling around the country, as I have done, and you visit factories in places like the Urals, which I have also done, you have no such illusions anymore. Italy and Spain cannot run a space program. They cannot run military operations in Syria. They cannot develop the Arctic in the way that Russia is doing. They cannot build these vast infrastructure programs that Russia is doing. They cannot uh, run free health care and education services to the extent that Russia can. And of course, they cannot do that whilst running a budget surplus at the same time. Uh, even on, on, a, on a purchasing power parity basis, Russia's economy becomes the, fourth, the fifth or sixth biggest in the world. In reality, it, in my opinion, it is actually much bigger than this. It is simply that the statistics have not yet caught up with the fact. And so how do you explain the, the, the gold and, and the Treasury, uh, the U.S. Treasury? Yeah. Uh, dumping? Yeah. What, what, yeah. What, do you, what do you think of, of that? Yeah, yeah. I, let, let's come back to that because I think that's important. First of all, I should tell you that I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about the story that Russia has sold off all, all or most of its U.S. Treasuries. Right. What I think has happened, and I saw a very interesting article in Zero Hedge, which rather confirmed that, is that, yes, they've sold off a large proportion of them. But I think a lot of them, they've simply transferred out of the United States uh, to places like the Cayman Islands and Belgium, where they hope and believe that they will be out of US reach. Because I think what the Russians are afraid of is that the US is going to try and seize Russia's financial reserves in US treasuries that are held in US soil. The point is that Russia doesn't actually, when we talk about Russia buying gold, Russia is buying the gold that it is itself mining. Russia is the second biggest gold producer. It's probably going to double its production of gold very long. Gold counts, in effect, as a hard currency. So, as I said, it will not run out of hard currency. It runs a surplus with the euro zone, so it won't run out of, out of, the euro, out of euros. It, it will still receive dollars because, of course, it sells so much of its gas and oil in dollars. So uh, it, it's not going to run out of financial reserves. Whatever the US does, however stringent the US try, uh, is in trying to impose financial restrictions on Russia. And, of course, the Russians are now also actively moving along with the Chinese in setting up alternative financial systems, alternative financial instruments, and in trading with other countries in local currencies. And I expect that is going to grow. So uh, wrapping it up on the financial instability and the currency instability that we're seeing right now, 
Uh, juxtaposition, Russia uh, going through this, this currency instability and Turkey. Russia, from everything that you're saying, Russia, this is going to be a bump on the road. But for Turkey, this could very well be significant and uh, could cause some, some massive hardships and, and maybe even changes to leadership. Can you go into a little more detail on that? These two economies um, riding out this, this summer of, of, of currency instability that we're seeing right now and what the effects might be as we head into the fall. Well, let, let, let's go back to what happened in 2014 when uh, our oil prices crashed. I mean, oil prices went down from $110 a barrel to just, just $40 a barrel. They, that was in 2014. And the US imposed actually very severe sanctions on Russia, even more severe in some respects than the ones that have been proposed now, because they stopped country, uh, uh, Western banks lending to Russian corporates. Um, everybody expected that there would be a massive problems in Russia and there was talk about how this was going to uh, uh, create a massive crisis within the political system and how the Russian businessmen, who are always called oligarchs in the West, a completely anachronistic statement, which has no truth to it, that they were going to revolt against Putin and remove him or force him to change his policies. What actually happened? Well, the rule the ruble did fall. The ruble fell a lot in 2014 and everybody thought this was going to create a crisis. What it actually did was it created a recession in which the Russian economy contracted by just 2%. I mean a very shallow recession which lasted for just one year. Compare that with, say, the 5% contraction that countries like Britain experienced in the 2008 crisis. I mean, it was a, a very slight recession. Unemployment barely rose. And Russia came out of it very quickly, and the economy is now growing again. It grew twice as fast last year as even the Russian government initially expected. So um, whatever the US throws at it, it will be just as you said, a bump in the road. With Turkey, I am sorry to say, I think it is different. The problem is that the, the, the situation there is very intractable. You did an excellent video the other day with Eric Krauss, uh, uh, the, the financial um, analyst, and I would, like, I would advise anybody watching this program to watch it. There are major problems in Turkey. These are compounded by the fact that the government in Turkey is not handling these problems at all well. And if this continues, despite a certain revival in the Turkish lira that we've seen today, I can very easily see Turkey falling into a major inflation spiral, and that might force a huge rise in interest rates and a very severe recession for an economy that is in very severe debt and which runs big deficits with the outside world. So I'm afraid it's an existential crisis in Turkey, which could very well result in political instability. And frankly, I don't think just, I don't think a bump in the road in Russia, mm -hmm. I think just a little, a little sort of uh, 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 adjustment, which most people, most people in Russia will barely notice. That's my own personal view. <laughs> Alexander Verkurs, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your analysis on the Russian economy and the ruble in these very uncertain and turbulent uh, financial times uh, that we are living through this summer, this August. Alexander Verkurs, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below and click on that notifications bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video. And visit the Duran shop. Help support us. Buy a t-shirt. Alexander McCurry, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Until next time, take care.